Um, so this was just to sort of help you orient yourselves um, with brain slices and also to understand how to extract a time series. And the principle that you've all seen is basically you get a coordinate and then you take all of the time points from that coordinate um, in order to extract a time series. And we'll use that in the future, um, the very new future. OK, the other things I wanted you to see was the difference between how detailed an anatomical scan is. Um, so it has very high spatial resolution. You can really see the details and how crappy the functional images are. Um, and that's because the functional images have very large voxels compared to the voxels of the anatomical. And the reason we have very large voxels is because we want to take an image of the brain every two seconds. Um, so we need to take fast images. So we sacrifice our spatial resolution to have better temporal resolution, to, be to be able to get many, many images. So I think it's written in the explanations that getting an anatomical image of the brain of one participant takes, say, six minutes. So six minutes just to get one image of the brain. But the functional images, we get one uh, image of the entire brain every two seconds. Um, but the resolution is not as good. Um, and the third thing I wanted you to see is that when you look at an actual signal from the brain, it's really hard to tell whether the response is harder to sentences or to non-words. And all, what we're going to do from now until the end is to try and solve that problem and make it easier. Um, OK. So let's try to analyze a time series. And we're going to start with an approach that is intuitive. And that's how people actually started analyzing fMRI data. And to foreshadow what we're going to see Soon, it's not going to work. Um, but I'm going to lead you through the things that don't work in order to explain why we do the things that do work and what problems it's solving. Um, OK, so for each voxel, we look at its time series that you've just extracted in the last exercise. So that's activity across time. And then we can average the signal across volumes that were collected while the participant was reading sentences. That means whenever you see a bump in the red plot, that means that all of these volumes, volumes were collected when the participant was reading sentences. So we average the activity here and here and here and here. Just the average of activity whenever there were sentences present. We do the same for non-words. So we average the signal across um, all the volumes collected while reading non-words. And then we compare the averages. And we ask whether the average of sentences is bigger than the average for non-words. Does that make sense? Cool. So let's say we get 100 versus 98. Is that different? Is that not different? What do you think? It depends. OK. Yes. Not different enough. OK. So it's really hard to tell, right? It's a different of two units. And a different of two units, I didn't even give you any sort of like anchor to understand whether two units is a lot or not a lot. So for example, you can look at a signal like this, where the mean of uh, the red dots is 100, and the mean of the blue dots is 98. And this signal looks like it does modulate pretty significantly um, between sentences and non-words. Right? You can see that the response to sentences is always very large, and, uh, or larger than to non-words. And it's always around 100. And the response to non-words is always consistently around 98. So in this case, I would like to say, yeah, this difference is real between 100 and 98. But you can also get this signal, where, again, the average of the red dots is 100 and the average of the blue dots is 98. But it seems like here the signal doesn't really change between sentences and non words. And any difference seems to be just random by chance. Um, and that is because our bold signal has both the uh, changes in activity that are related to the task, to the fact that you were reading either sentences or non-words, but it also has noise due to many other things, the, uh, other things that that voxel neurons in that voxel happen to be doing, um, noise that comes from the measurement, the machine itself, the MRI, um, noise that comes because participants move their head and that completely ruins our data. Um, and all of that noise is also a part of the signal. And we need to take that noise into account. Another way of thinking about the signal and the noise is to say that any change that is due to the task is change that we can explain. So any variation in the signal between the red dots and the blue dots is a, is a variation that we can explain. It's because of our task. And the noise is unexplained variations. So the fact that these red dots are not all exactly the same height, we can't explain this. According to our prediction, if you're reading sentences, activity should be the same. I can't explain why these different red dots have different heights. That's noise. So these are unexplained variations. Are we cool with that? OK. Um, OK, so let's try something a little better. Um, 
the difference in response between sentences and non-words might be not real. It might be just due to chance. To test how likely the difference is to be real, um, we take the noise into account. And if you've taken any like introductory statistics class, you already know this. The simplest way to do this is to do a t-test or compute a t-value, which is basically the difference between the averages, the averages of all the red dots, the averages of all the blue dots, divided by some measure of noise um, to take the noise into account. OK. Um, in other words, we divide the explained variations by the unexplained variations. OK. We know how likely it is to get different t values by chance. This is, we have a mathematical formula that tells us how likely different t values are. To believe our results are real, we want a t value that is very what to get by chance? Think about it. Very likely to get by chance or very unlikely to get by chance? If we want to believe that our results are real, we want a t value that is very unlikely to get by chance, right? If we get a value that is unlikely to get by chance, that it must be real. If we get a value that is very likely to get by chance, that it's probably by chance. Um, OK. So let's look at this. Here are the two signals I showed you before, the one that looked kind of real and the one that looked uh, less real, or uh, like the difference was not real. And here I show you in bars the mean of the red points and the mean of the blue points and these small uh, bars of the error bars to show you the amount of variations. Um, and you can see that in the first instance, we have a difference of two between the averages with very little unexplained variation. Well, in the second case, we again have a difference of two between the bars, but the variations in within each condition are very, very large. So the unexplained variations are very large. Um, so this is less likely to be due to chance. This is more likely to be due to chance. Um, OK. Just a question um, to make sure you understand what's going on. The difference between sentences and non-words might be due to chance. The more noisy our data are, what does this difference need to be in order for us to believe it's real? Just think about it so that everyone gets a chance to answer. We all good? OK, what do we think? Bigger. OK, the more noisy our data are, we need a bigger difference to believe that it's real, right? The, because the more noise there is, a, a given difference would be just more likely to get you to chance. You can also look at it uh, with the formula. We divide by the noise, and we want a t value that is very, very, very big. t values that are very big are not likely due to chance. Um, so the more we increase our denominator, the more we need to also increase our nominator. OK. Here are two brain signals that I actually took from the real brain that you will analyze and the brain that you've seen before. Uh, and because it's hard to sort of see the difference between the red dots and the blue dots, let's just color them. OK, so sentences and non-words. Who thinks that the first voxel um, is a voxel that lies within the language system. Who here thinks that the second voxel is a voxel that lies within the language system? And also the, the voxel is just like the place in the brain from which I took that signal. And that to a dot. Yeah, a dot in the image of the brain, exactly. OK, so like I wanted you to see in the last exercise you did, it's really hard to tell. And in this case, it looks like both of these voxels, the changes are not related to sentences versus non-words. They're, they're just some noise. Um, here are the averages and the, and the errors. And both of these are non-significant if you test them statistically. So there is no significant difference between the response to sentences and to non-words. The first voxel is a voxel that I took from outside the language system, because I already analyzed the data, so I know where the language system of that participant is. The second voxel is a voxel that I did take from the language system. And it doesn't look like it. But I promise you that it is a voxel from the language system that responds more strongly to sentences than to non-words. And the question is, why does this not work? And this is why people at the beginning of fMRI had to try and understand, why does this method not work? OK. So to understand why it doesn't work, let's think a little bit about how the brain operates. So this, these are our stimuli. This is where sentences come up and when non-words come up. We know that neural activity should start immediately or a few, hundred, or a few tens of milliseconds after we see the stimuli, right? So basically, 
As soon as you see sentences, your neurons in your language system should start firing. And as soon as you see non-words, the neurons in your language system should start firing as well. But what about the bold signal? fMRI doesn't measure neural activity directly, it measures the bold signal. And when neurons are active, the fMRI bold signal will rise. Think about this, you should know this from the last lecture. What do you think? Six, even six to 12. So the peak is usually around five, six, sometimes later, um, uh, seconds after the stimuli come on or comes up. So we were averaging the wrong points, right? We were averaging the points in time where sentences were presented. But the points in time where the language system would respond are actually a little later, right? They're like five, six, seven, eight seconds later. So we're actually averaging the wrong points. So first of all, what we need to do um, is to understand that the points we're looking at are, should be shifted in time. So let's do that. And let's see what happens. These are original signals. Now I'm going to push all of my red and blue uh, rectangles a little forward and change the color of the dots. OK, now let's average these and see whether we solve the problem. So these are the averages and the errors. You can see a small difference here between sentences and non-words. Um, but large errors, and again, these two are not significant. So it looks like that voxel doesn't respond differentially to sentences versus non-words. Again, this is not working. <laughs> yes? What is the time scale then? What is the length of the signal? Uh, so the TR is 2, so it's 2 by oh. 179 volumes. Um, OK, so it still doesn't work. And it doesn't work because we assumed that the bold signal changes like that from 0 to 1. But you already know that bold signals don't change like that. When we measure the bold signal, we get the hemodynamic response function that Nancy showed you, where you get a smooth and slow increase and then a smooth and slow, and slow decrease. And it doesn't look binary like that. So what we have to do is we need to make our prediction look more like this. And this is done by a mathematical process called convolution. Um, you don't need to understand what convolution is, but it's like filtering. We take this signal and we filter it with that shape to make it look more like that shape. So it kind of look like this. I, sh I filter the signal and it turns into something that looks more like the hemodynamic response function. Okay? Cool. And we do the same for the blue signal and now these, are, these should be our bold predictions. This is what we should expect from our signal to look like. Okay, so let's go back to uh, how we should answer our question. OK. Now the question is, which points am I averaging, if these are my predictions? I can average all of these points that fall somewhere in the red region. That doesn't seem very good, because the last point already has some response to non-words, right? So I might not want to do this. Also, here the response is really low. OK, so let's look at a narrower range to average, and let's just average these points. Still not very good because you see that the signal here has different heights, right? I mean, different intensities. It's all not uniform. So just averaging all these points and treating them as if they're the same, it's not true because my prediction is that they won't be the same. OK, so let's throw a little more and let's just keep the points that really look the same. Now the problem is that I'm throwing like 75% of my data and not even using it, which is a shame. So this averaging. Uh, method is not going to work anymore. Now that our predictions look like this and they're not binary, just simply averaging points is not going to work. So we need to shift our perspective and do something different. But what we'll do eventually will be, again, looking at explained variations in the signal versus unexplained variations. Just the framework is going to be a little different. OK, so we need a more principled solution, not just to arbitrarily choose which points to average. OK. So to, th to understand why or uh, what, pr what principled solutions we're, solution we're going to find, let's go back to our question. Our question is, which regions respond more to sentences than to non-words? And if you look at a signal from a voxel, you can think that the time series of language voxels, so time series of voxels that actually lie within the language system, should look like a combination of these two things but this thing might be a little more stretched vertically, so the increases should be really large. And this, uh, this thing should be a little uh, shrinked vertically, so the increase should be smaller. 
right? So voxels in the language system should really respond a lot to sentences, respond a little less to non-words. And then we, if we stretch this and shrink this and combine these two, the signal in the language system should look something like that. Does that make sense? Yes, no, you look confused. OK, no, not cool. So I'll show you a demonstration of this. OK, the idea is that if you take a real signal from the brain, you can approximate it by combining three signals. The first signal is just a baseline signal or a constant signal. This is just the whatever average activity there is in that voxel when you're doing nothing. And then response to sentences, and then a response to non-words. And if I take these three lines and I add them together, I can, get a prediction, I can get an approximation of a real signal. And I'll show you an example now with a demonstration in MATLAB. Uh, let me see. Yeah, baseline. So when you're not doing nothing, when you're resting, different voxels have different baseline activities. It's not zero. We're actually recording some signal, right? Because the neurons are doing something. Um, so let me show you what this looks like. I know you can't see anything. Where am I? OK, good. So what you see on the top um, is the actual signal of a voxel from the brain. And then you see the baseline prediction, the prediction for changes in signal when you read sentences, and the prediction for changes in signal when you read non-words. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate the real signal by adding these three, uh, three predictions together. The first thing I'm going to do can't really see this. OK, I'm going to multiply the baseline by 97. Why? Because the average of that signal, the average of the real signal, seems to be 97. It seems to be overall you're around 97. So I'm, so I'm going to multiply this by 97. And the, what you see, you see in pink is what I have. Now I'm going to add the response to sentences. I'm going to multiply this by 0.97, which means basically multiplying it by 1. So just adding this thing to this thing. And that's what I get now. A little more, uh, it approximates the real signal a little better. And now I'll add the third one. I'll multiply the third one by 0.44. So that means taking this and shrinking it by half, right? This is almost 0.5. So this is like taking this and just shrinking it by half and adding it. And this is an approximation of the real signal, right? Not a perfect one. But it kind of looks like the real signal, right? Does this make sense? So I'll show you how we get that. But for now, imagine that I just try all these different numbers until I get an approximation that works really well. Um, here's another example. Another signal. Here, the average of the signal seems to be around 97 or 98. So I'll multiply the baseline by that. Now I'm going to multiply the red line by 1.2, which means stretching it by 20% and adding it. And the third one by 0 0.5 again. Oh, so you're just kind of guessing this number, don't you think they overlap? Yes, and your exercise is going to be exactly guessing these numbers. And then I'll show you how you can find them without guessing. But for now, we're just guessing, and I already did the guessing for you. Yes? How quickly do I need to stretch the signal for sentences and then stretch the signal for non-words? I don't always need to do that. But if some voxel responds more to sentences than to non-words, right now these two predictors saying that the increase is the same for both conditions. Some voxels don't show the same amount of increase for both conditions. They increase their activity more to sentences and less to non-words. So I need to make one of them bigger and one of them smaller. Here in these two predictions? So these two predictions, what happens is that I just put zeros when there is no stimuli and one when there is a stimulus. And then I convolve it with the HRF. And then I just get things that get up to one and then fall back. Also, I can, you know, I can shrink this and increase this, but I don't know by how much. In one voxel, the response to this might be twice as large. It might be maybe only 50% you know, more or, or like, uh, I don't know, like 30% uh, more, 10% more. OK. Here's another example of another signal. So we have the baseline. Now it's 132. Now I multiply the sentences by almost by 1, so I'm not really changing them. And I multiply the non-words also almost by 1. So now the best approximation I can get is when I treat these two things almost the same. 
which means that this is a voxel that re increases its response to sentences and to non-words to the same degree, not like the two voxels we've seen before that respond more to sentences and less to non-words. Let's look at another voxel. So here the average is 118. The sentences, to get a good approximation, I need to multiply them by 1.7. And to get a good approximation, I need to multiply non-words by 1.6. So now I'm stretching this one much more than this. So this is a voxel, not from the language system, from somewhere else in the brain, that actually responds more to this, right? I'm stretching this more, and responds less to this. A voxel responds more to sentences than to non-words. In your exercises, you'll get some idea of where that voxel might come from. And here's another uh, example, baseline, sentences, non-words. And here I get the best approximation by multiplying these two by almost zero, which means just flattening them. Which means this is a voxel that doesn't respond to sentences, it doesn't respond to non-words. It just doesn't care. Maybe that's, for example, a voxel in the auditory cortex. And there is nothing auditory in our experiment. Everything is red. So it doesn't really care about the experiment. It's just doing something else. It doesn't increase it, uh, its activity in this way. It doesn't increase its activity in this way. And the last thing, I think this is the last one, baseline. To get a good approximation, I need to multiply sentences by minus 0.6 and non-words by minus 0.6 as well. This is a voxel that actually decreases its response. So multiplying this by a negative number means I'm flipping it around. So now instead of increasing, the signal will decrease because I'm multiplying everything by minus one. This is a voxel that decreases its response to sentences as to non-words. Um, again, not from the language system, from somewhere else. Okay, and I think that's it. Yes, that's it. Um, Mm -hmm. in which case you would get, you would never get a good approximation. Right. Exactly. Okay, so we did this. Okay. So these signals that we use to construct the approximation, they're called predictors. So each one of these is a predictor. One predictor predicts a constant response, just baseline. Another predictor predicts how you should re uh, respond if you care about sentences, and another predictor predicts how you should respond if you care about non-words. Each predictor is associated with a number or a weight, right? When we do this combination, I multiply each predictor by a number. We call these beta weights. And to create a linear combination of predictors, which approximates the true signal, I just multiply each predictor by the weight, and then I sum everything together. So here, again, another voxel. Um, these are the betas for this voxel. And this is the voxel that we've seen before from the language system, the voxel that I told you I took from the language system. These are the three numbers that make the best approximation. This is the approximation. You can see that it's not so bad. It approximates the signal pretty well. And you see that the beta for sentences is much larger than the beta for non-words. Right? I stretch this by 20%, I shrink this by half. This voxel responds more strongly to sentences than to non-words. Now we can see this. We can see this through these, number. we, these numbers. We couldn't see it before. OK. Um, just to see how this thing looks, so how the, the final prediction relates to the predictors. At first, when the experiment just starts, there is nothing, nothing on the screen. And the only thing contributing at this point to my pink prediction is just the baseline. Because this is at 0, this is at 0, this is at 1. I multiplied by 97, almost 98. So I get something that's almost 98. Now let's move a little in time. Now I move here. At this point, there are sentences on the screen, or there, were, there was just a sentence on the screen five seconds before. Now, this is still 0, but this is 1 and this is 1. So these two things are going to contribute. This is going to um, be multiplied by 97. This is going to be multiplied by 1.2. When you add these two together, you get 99. And indeed, the signal here is 99. So my prediction is 99 because it's 97 times this plus 1.2 times this. This is 0, so it doesn't contribute anything. And then let's move to the non-words. Now what happens is this, again, con contributes 97.8. This is at 0. It doesn't contribute anything. This is at 1, so it contributes 0.5. So overall, I'm going to have 0.5 
uh, 97.8, which is 98.3. And that's what you have at that point. Does that make sense? So I'm just trying to show you how these three betas and the three predictors generate the final prediction in pink, or the approximation. OK. Beta 2, or the beta for sentences in our case, estimates a voxel's increase in activity in response to sentences. That's what that number tells you. And this is the thing that if you go and ask grad students that work with fMRI data for like five years or postdocs and you ask them what does the beta tell you, they don't know to give you this definition. A beta weight tells you how much the signal increases in response to sentences. In other words, a beta tells you that when this uh, predictor goes from 0 to 1, the signal in the brain goes, increases by 1.2 units. A beta of half tells you that when this thing goes from 0 to 1, the response in the brain increases by half a unit. Does that make sense? OK. In MATLAB, predictors are column vectors. I'm going to show you soon while these things can be, how these things can be thought of as column vectors. We just call them x's. Beta weights are just numbers. And an approximation, like the pink thing here, is created simply you just multiply a number by the vector plus a number by the vector plus a number by the vector. So just to see why these things can be thought of as vectors, if I just look at them vertically, a number times vector plus a number times vector plus a number times vector equals another vector. And these things are just numbers. So I can plot them like this. I can also plot them with colors. So let's put 0 in black and uh, 1 in white. So it looks like this. It's exactly the same thing. Whenever you see white here, there are sentences. Whenever you see white here, there are non-words. And this is just an image. You know that images are vectors in MATLAB, right? These are just numbers between zeros and 1. So these are vectors. OK, so now what I want you to do is you have some exercises where you see a signal, and you need to guess the numbers. You need to guess the beta weights to best approximate the signal. Um, so you can guess them again and again and again until you think you found the best approximation. To help you, all the betas are integers. So it's just going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, no, uh, no fractions. And this is just to give you an idea of how predictors combine to create um, approximations. OK, so it's exercises 5 to 9. 5 through 8 are all the same. If you think you got it after 2, just skip the other 2. It's all the same. It's always you see a signal and you need to guess the numbers. 9 is a little bit different. Um, so from 5 to 8, try doing 1 or 2. If you think you get it, just move on.